Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs and the host of Vegas Rock Dog Radio. On today's show, I'm talking about the difference between dogs in England and the US and other seasonal pet stuff. So stay right there. Welcome to the show. Your face is a picture, Jim. I'm your host, Sam, and I'll tell you why in a second. I'm your host, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs, and this is Vegas Rock Dog Radio. We are a rock and roll show all about pets, people, and pop culture. Thank you for being here. Ta-da! Jim's face. It's funny. I put a slightly different bumper in this morning, and it threw you for a little loop there, didn't it, Jim? Didn't meet the criteria. <laughs> of what? Just being used to something. Where I was supposed to flip a switch. Yes, I saw your face like, <laughs> what's happening? Exactly. Yeah, throwing a quick a quick new bumper there this morning. Well, welcome, everybody. We are live from Las Vegas, and we've got lots to talk about today, as usual. As usual. Got a big update, haven't we, Jim? We do. Why is my voice so deep today? Well, I think it's because you went out in the cold to walk the dogs. Wouldn't it be higher than that? <laughs> like, oh, my God, it's freezing. It seems like very. <laughs> it was cold and damp today. <laughs> very cold and damp today. Mm, make some adjustments here to my <laughs> equalizations. Yeah, tell us what your experience is. Does your voice drop when it's it's warmer or when it's colder? <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> okay, so let's get started with this show. Uh, lots to talk about today, and if you are brand new to the show, thanks for being here. We do this funny <coughs> update, what well, we think we're funny, a funny update at the top of the show, of, and we try not to have Jim cough through the show. I think we can still hear it, though. I'm sure of it. Um, <laughs> it's because he's been out in the cold. Um, what was I saying? What was I saying? Yeah, we do a little update at the top of the show, and then we cover the topics. I've got quite a few topics in this show and of course some really fun seasonal stuff because it's Christmas it's Hanukkah, it's Kwanzaa it's it's just a great time of year, it's always a lot of fun this time of year, it's my favourite time of year so we're going to go over some bits and pieces but let me tell you how you can find us on the internet our wi main website is vegasrockdogradio.com you can also find us on Periscope, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Tumblr, and Instagram. Um, we have a blog. Our blog is therockandrolldog.com. And uh, you can find the show if you miss it live. Oh, that's sad. But if you do miss the show, <laughs> the live show, then you can always catch up on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spoke by SiriusXM, and Spotify. And any other podcast app that you may have. But they're the main ones I think that most people use. Now, yesterday, I did update my, uh, I have a, a little store on Hound & Co. And I updated and added our notebooks. I added a couple of dog collars, our tank tops. So I will put a link um, on the show notes and also on our social media if you're interested in picking up some swag for you and your pets. Okay, so here's the big update. I just got back from England, and in between the flying there and back, it was amazing. <laughs> the going was horrific. It took me 30 hours with delays. Ridiculous. Coming back, it took me two days. 
ridiculous. But in between all of that, I had a brilliant time. Now, Jim had to stay behind for commitments, unfortunately. And I have to say, I don't know how many times we said, oh, Jim would have loved this. Jim would have loved this. But I did have a wonderful... Yeah. I get my own vacation this year now. <laughs> That's not how it works. I get a makeup vacation. To yeah, get but I will, be with no, I will be with you. Then we wouldn't be even. <laughs> <laughs> we have to make it even. Yeah, but what, all, what about all these lovely tour dates that you go on? Mm, Those are New work. York, Those Toronto, are work Vancouver, and you went on them. Those Florida. Are work days. Omaha. Work days. Mm. Work days. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I had a great time with my family and friends, and I enjoyed meeting loads of dogs. I mean, everywhere there were dogs. Now, I don't think I even told you about this, Jim. And I'm sure if you are a regular listener to the show, you know that I'm obsessed with Chatsworth House in Derbyshire. It's a royal house. It's amazing. I've been obsessed since I was about five years old. And, of course, I have to take a little trip there when we go back. The last time Jim and I went back is where we, we actually even knew our wedding grounds there. And this year, oh, th my timing was good because it's Christmas. And so the house has a theme. Twixie's jumping up all over. Oh, my gosh. Who even knows what's going to go over on that side of the studio because Twixie's just jumping around on Jim. <laughs> um, Christmas. So the house has a theme every Christmas. And this year it was Once Upon a Time. So they they they've taken all of these classic fairy tales and they've integrated pieces from the house, historical pieces from the house into the story. So, for example, the little... Uh, there's a lot of noise going on. What's going on with these two? That's Thornton and Twix, by the way, in case you don't know. Um, they've incorporated, you know, say pieces from the house. So the little shoemaker, which was fantastic, the whole setup was amazing. The little shoemaker or the old lady in the shoe? No, the little shoemaker. Mm -hmm. And they'd incorporated shoes from the royal babies into the whole scene. Oh, it was amazing. So, so amazing. Just a brilliant day. I think Serena and I were there for six hours because we went to the Christmas market first, which is just outside, and we sampled a lot of gin. <laughs> Gin's a big thing right now in England. It's huge, it, apart from Prosecco, which everybody loves as well. Anyway, so, so I followed Villager Jim for a long time. What is going on? Oh, they, they're just going to have a fight now in the middle of the, the show. <laughs> uh, I'm keeping my mic off because there's a lot of sound effects <laughs> right now. Yeah, we've got tails whacking against it. Really? Of all the times for that, they've just been on a big long walk, though, is, haven't they? How long was the walk? About four and a half <laughs> today. Not long enough because they're <laughs> all energized. <laughs> oh, let's, let's see if they calm down in a bit. But anyway, so Jim... You know, I followed Villager Jim at Chatsworth. Right. And he's the photographer. And they call him the Banksy of photography, of the photography world. He's the official photographer there. For Chatsworth, yeah. yes. He can he can go anywhere in the ground anywhere in the grounds and photograph the wildlife. And he has names for all the animals. It is brilliant. Now Banksy, if you don't know who Banksy is, he's an English based street artist. Uh, they call him a vandal. <laughs> well, I guess he is political activist, and he's a film director. But he is anonymous. This is ridiculous. I can't have that. <laughs> I can't hear anything. They're going to settle down. I'm going to turn my mic off. <laughs> so they'll be all right. Anyway, so Banksy is anonymous, and so is Villager Jim, and that's why they call him the Banksy of photography. And um, and and so I say I followed his page. I later find out that he happens to be related to one of my closest friends, yeah? Uh, anyway, he's known as, um, uh, well, see, no one knows what he looks like, but she did tell me, hey, he's going to be at the Christmas market with all of his photography. So Serena and I made our way over there. Well, guess what? He wasn't there. His, his wife was there. <laughs> so I guess he was really, really anonymous that day. So I didn't get to meet Villager Jim. I did get to meet his wife. We had a little selfie, sent it back to our friend Tracy. I say she's related to them. But the the photography is stunning. His captions are fantastic. They're funny. I mean, so beautiful. So that is Villager Jim, the wildlife photographer over at Chatsworth House. Now, I didn't really keep my feet on the ground too much when I was in back home in Sheffield. I went to Bath 
and that's where my nephew is studying at Bath University. Do you know it's the most expensive university in the country? And he's doing three degrees. Wow. He's doing three degrees. And he was the lead in Pirates of Penzance. So that's why I went down there to see him perform. And it was amazing. But you feel like you're stepping back in time in Bath. Now in Bath, if you build something new, you've got to use the stone on the quarry and everything looks the same. And it is beautiful, filled with history. Did you know Mary Shelley lived there? Frankenstein. She wrote Frankenstein. I knew that. Oh, everybody knows that. Not everybody knows that, Jim. Anyway, so that was my bath trip. It was brilliant. Then we ran off to Derby. <laughs> and that was for a family wedding, my niece's wedding. Is that where Terrence Trent Darby is from? No. And <laughs> that was so cheesy. What's his name? That was so cheesy. People don't even know who he is. And my niece got married at the West Mill, which is it's 1800s. That's how old it is. And it was the most amazing family day that we ever had. It was crazy. It went on for about 12 hours. And even uh, what the great thing is, it's got different levels. It's got different levels. And each level, you do something different for your wedding. So reception here, uh, uh, ceremony here dinner here and then it was like a nightclub pub that we went to on another floor that was brilliant with a band and then nibbles came out at nine o'clock and then we all piled back to this amazing hotel that we stayed in for an after party and i finally went to bed at four i actually went to bed before the bride <laughs> no the bride went to bed before me i stayed up it was brilliant so that was derby amazing place to visit as well and overall it was just such and i was in halifax it was just such a fantastic trip and, like I said, I met many, 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 many dogs. Many dogs. And so a little bit later on in the show, well, like in two seconds, I'm going to talk about what I observed as the differences between the dogs and the pet owners, both in the UK and the US. Because I can do that, because I've got the experience of both of them. Anyway, so that was that little update. It was an amazing time. Did lots of shopping. Did, ate lots of chocolate. Brought lots of chocolate back. Because <laughs> that's essential especially when it comes to Christmas. Um, talking of Christmas, there is a show happening here in Vegas with our friend Murray Sawchuck, and he has chosen Friends for Life and Rocking for Rescues to uh, charities to benefit from his magic show at Starbright Theatre December 22nd. It will be in the show notes. I'm running a raffle prior to that that will benefit both the charities and uh, once again, we're thankful to Murray for choosing Rocking for Rescues once again to benefit from his Christmas show. And it sells out. So I think the three quarters sold out already, which is great news. And again, helping animals. Talked about notebooks a little bit earlier. The cat notebook is out. The meow notebook is out. The bunny notebook is soon to be out. And the dog notebook is out. So you can go to uh, Amazon or click on the notes here. Or you can go to any of my social media platforms. You'll find links on there as well for notebooks. When's the hedgehog and the badger notebooks come coming in, out? It's coming. They're all coming, Jim. <laughs> um, People are asking. Are all, I'm also linking below this tutorial of a paw wreath that I made for friends last year. And they love them. Now, they're not just for Christmas. I also made a Hanukkah one for my friend Joni, and they can be for birthdays, you could do spring, whatever you want to do. And it's a great tutorial. In the tutorial on my blog, it will uh, list all the supplies that you will need, and you can pick them all up on my um, Amazon. But it's a really, really lovely uh, DIY paw wreath, and you can scale it up or you can scale it down. So I made some small, I made a couple of really huge ones. But here's a funny story about the one I made for Pam, yeah? The one I made for Pam, <laughs> She moved, it was turquoise and purple, their favorite colors. She moved to Iowa, put it on her front door, and the do the dogs, not the dogs, the birds, Jim, because you know it's made out of, what do they call that stuff? The Bird seeds. No, the wreath. Hay. No, it's not hay. <coughs> it's like twigs. What do they call it? Twigs. No, <laughs> there's a name for it. Anyway, I don't know, I got a the dog. birds dog. picked every single little twig off it and made themselves their, uh, a nest, yeah. Eventually, it fell apart. It was good for the wildlife. <laughs> it, w it was. All that was left were the bones. That was its purpose. <laughs> so that's what happened with that. Um, I just want to say a big congratulations to my sisters who raised money for Cavendish Cancer Care and back in Sheffield through their 70s Zumbathon. It was brilliant. They went as Velma and Daphne from Scooby-Doo. 
amazing. One of the best cartoons. People, ever. people went full on. Hanna Barbera. Yeah, you want to tell people about Hanna Barbera? Yeah, no, go. We told them before. No, we haven't, have we? My grandmother's cousins were the Barberas. There you go. Come on, say all kinds of connections. Isn't that something? <laughs> It's hard to run a show with a dog demanding attention. Yeah, I'm looking at Twix. He's like a baby right there. He's ridiculous. Uh, last item, Christmas. Um, I have an influencer page on Amazon, and I've put together Christmas items in an entire list, the ones that I think are just really great gifts for pets and pet lovers. I'm also putting a Hanukkah one together as well, so that will also be in the show notes. Okay, so here we go. Let me talk about the difference between dogs in the U.S. and the U.K., their accent. <laughs> it is. It is. They talk in such an accent. And these are my observations. It doesn't matter what the weather is, the Bre- Brits still go out with their pets. That's like us. No. We, no. Just, we just went out in the weather. You did. We're, we're different. But in Vegas, and we'll tell you about Vegas, not so much here. And it only has to drizzle and people are not even leaving their house in Vegas. And we act like it's a hurricane outside. And you know that for a fact. How many people post on a rainy day, oh, my dog wee-weed all pooed in the house today. It's because they didn't go out because it was raining. <laughs> That's what happens. But they do, what they do is back home, they bundle them up. And they're very practical. The coats are very, what's the word? Durable. Yes, functional for the weather. Proof. Yeah, it is. It's weatherproof. The boots go on and everybody goes out and they walk. But we are a nation of walkers anyway. I walked a lot when I was there and I loved it. I really, really loved it. And we walk everywhere we possibly can. And it's, it is the norm to take your dogs with you. It is absolutely the norm. And I didn't see any obese dogs. I didn't see any overweight dogs. I, and I saw a lot of dogs. I didn't see any obese dogs but i think that's you know part of we walk an insane amount now i know it's a little bit different here because you know to walk to say the corner shop you've got a long walk here because everything is so spread out but we are a nation of walkers so i do feel that people walk a lot lot more in britain and they do just take you know you just take them that's it um and you'll find that dogs are everywhere in the uk and now no state by state city by city Depending on what the laws are, it can be a very pet-friendly place like San Diego where they're very welcoming and go in the stores with your pets and it's wonderful. Or it can be like Vegas where we sat on a cold patio the other night. <laughs> very cold patio. But, you know, we were at Lazy Dogs. I'm not a fan. I think the menu's got a little bit better. I think they must have changed it because of the season. But here's my thing. Uh, can dogs just be on the patio or are you really pet friendly? I think that's the difference for me. I know they have a menu. I won't give my dogs what's on that menu because it's just chicken and rice. I'm not doing that. But is it really, you know, they've got all these rules. You can't have them on your lap. You can't have them da-da-da-da-da, blah, 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 blah. There's all these <laughs> rules. Is that really pet friendly? And I know it's apparently to do with our laws. But this is why people don't go out with the pets because they're quite restricted here. Don't you think, Jim? Yes, and Mr. Twix agrees. Saying that, though, we did have all the dogs on our laps. <laughs> it was flipping freezing. Mr. We needed them for the walk. Mr. Twix says, let my people be. <laughs> yes. Not free, but be. It was cold. Oh, it's heated that patio. I'm going to tell you, my friends, you were frozen to the bone, weren't you, Jim? My feet were. Yeah. yeah they were wet. It was not warm on the patio, so don't believe that. <laughs> and I had a big giant puffer coat on. I looked like I was going to the moon <laughs> in that coat. I didn't care. I wanted to be warm. All the dogs were wrapped up in blankets. It was cute. There was a little. We, uh, we were we were there celebrating our friend's birthday, and uh, it was lovely to have all the littles were with us. The littles were th- with us. But I think that's the difference. So in, say in England, you go to the pub with dogs. I went to Chatsworth House. Now the, t- the dogs not allowed in Chatsworth House unless it's obviously a service dog. But the market. I took so many pictures, Jim. It was slammed. I mean, slammed with dogs. And it was not a warm day. It was. It's because the English go out in the weather. We just do. It was dreary. That's all you have there is It was weather. a little bit muddy. But, oh, it was a great time. It was a great time. Uh, so my other um, point is, like I say, it depends on how pet friendly it is. You know, depending on laws and all that stuff. But you definitely see a lot more dogs. Um 
you know, in, in all kinds of areas. I mean, it would be quite hard to take your dog to. I mean, a pub is a different environment from a bar, though, isn't it, Jim? Yeah. I mean, a pub is relaxed. It's like being in your living room. Yep. It's quiet. Homey. Ho- very homey. But a bar, I, I don't know. I, won't, I would never take dogs to a bar. That would be, <laughs> it might not go down too well. <laughs> but I do think pubs are defi- definitely more suited to to you bringing your dogs along. Now, what I didn't see, I didn't see people fawning over the dogs that they saw. Unlike myself, of course, I did fawn all over every dog because I was missing my own dogs. I kind of can't help it. <laughs> but I will attribute that to the sheer fact that you see dogs everywhere. They're not a novelty. Whereas in the, in the U.S., they're not seen as often, so people always want to come up and talk and pet and touch your dogs. And I think there's a big difference in that. So you say you're more American when it comes to <coughs> um, being in public with dogs. You act more. American. No, no, I'm me. No. <laughs> I'm just me. I love dogs. Somebody's talking to me. It was important for me to take lots of pictures with these dogs, too. (laughs) But but people are used to seeing dogs all the time, no matter where you go. What's going on? Did they have their breakfast yet? No. Good Lord. Really? She's going to stop the show? She's she's pegging the meter. She's going. She's (laughs) going up. She's pegging the meters on them board right <laughs> now. Th- Thornty, you need a microphone. D- are you talking to the audience? Do you need a microphone? Are you talking to the listeners? <laughs> what's happening to my show? Are you letting the listeners what know what's happening? What is happening to my show? Okay. What is happening to my show? Well, it looks like... Uh, <laughs> it's a dog show. You're 23 minutes in. I, I know. I'm going... I need to... Can you pick her up? Why don't we... No, no that's I'm not going to happen. I'm not finished. I'm not finished. I know, but... Okay. Just pick her up for me, please. Pick her up. Oh, she's so big. She's wrecking my show today. She's the, she's the she's the third host. Jim, can you pick her up? Thank you. Then I'll just wrap up this topic without all of that go- going on. It's a true dog show, pet show, isn't it? Um, where was I? Oh my gosh. So I say I just don't think that that. Um, Really, there's some craziness going on. Normally, they're very quiet. <laughs> it's a real authentic show. Um, uh, so, are dogs better behaved in the UK as opposed to the US? I heard someone mention that who'd visited the American that visited the, the UK. They go, the dogs are way more behaved. But here, here's what it is. Oh, and people got so bent out of shape. <laughs> but don't get bent out of shape if you're in the US. <laughs> don't get bent out of shape. This is what what she meant, and I understand that they're not necessarily better behaved. It's just that dogs in the UK get far more opportunities to socialize with other dogs and people. They're exposed to more situations like, you know, going on the train, crowded Christmas markets, the pub. I just don't think dogs in the US get as many opportunities to get used to traffic, horses, people, dogs, trains. And and I think that's the, that's the difference. We all know the more that our pets are in, in, s- in uh, a variety of situations, the more they become used to it, the calmer they are. And I think that's the difference. So, yeah, don't get bent out of shit because that's not what we're saying. <laughs> but in conclusion, I would l- love to see, and I've always said this, the U.S. become way more pet friendly so our dogs can spend more time with us and enjoy lots of different experiences. And um, it was lovely to see so many dogs. And I heard the breeds that you'll see a lot of. Greyhounds, you don't see too many here. I see a lot of greyhounds. Uh, beagles, of course. Jack Russells. Mm, what else did I see? Oh, a lot of bully breeds. Lots of bully breeds. And I think they were the main ones that I saw. Oh, and uh, collie dogs. Jim. Uh, sorry, I don't know. You, you were on your phone, weren't you? Yeah, I have, yeah. To, I have to answer a question. <laughs> you were busy. Not you in the middle. <laughs> you didn't have any dead air time. There wasn't <laughs> any place for me to say anything. <laughs> not like there was time for me well to Well, it's speak. not like you were listening. <laughs> So that was my that was my experience, were my observations, and as I say, I would love to see v- Vegas. I always moan about it because I just don't think they're pet friendly enough by no means. But I guess the laws are very restrictive as to what you can do with your dog. But saying that, how many times have we <laughs> just kind of ignored them, Jim? Particularly at our Starbucks, we just kind of just go in with dogs, don't we? Yeah, all well, the time. Uh, they don't say they don't. 
they don't tell anything to the students that bring their own food in from the outside. <laughs> so why should they say anything to someone with a little dog in their arm? Uh, who's paying to paying for their coffee and <laughs> their treats and stuff? Um, we do, we've always got a, a dog of some kind with us, haven't we? All bundled up, and uh, that's how we like it. That's how we like it. But I have to tell you, my Starbucks people are so lovely. I really love animals. Really love animals. So yeah, they're not going to say anything. Okay, Jim, we finally got to the first break. Finally. <laughs> it was different this morning. I feel like I was trying to pat my head at the same time as rubbing my belly. That's what that felt like right now. It was like an out-of-body experience, trying to get two different things to work. All right, so <laughs> we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we can talk about some holiday stuff, some Christmas stuff for, for our pets. So uh, you're listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio with me, Sam, your host, the queen of rock and roll dogs, and we will be right back. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. Pet Scene Magazine is dedicated to Las Vegas pets and the people who love them. It's a source of news and information for pet lovers, as well as offering valuable coupons and specials on pet products and services. Find them online at www. Dot lvpetscene.com or look for them on Facebook. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. Hi everyone, welcome back. You know, I have a TV going on in the studio and Saturdays and Sundays we tend to watch a lot of wildlife nature programs and we're, I'm just looking at, <laughs> I don't know what I'm looking at. It looks like a hybrid giraffe zebra. It looks like a gazebra. What is that? I think it's a giraffe. But a giraffe doesn't have stripes. Does uh, it? It could be. It's a baby. Those are hog piglets, though. <laughs> now I've got to find out what the heck that is. It, it definitely looks like a giraffe, but its lower end is all striped like a zebra. Interesting. I'm going to figure out what that is. Well, let's talk about some Christmas... Holiday stuff, Hanukkah stuff. Eggnog. You love eggnog, don't you, Jim? It is delicious. I'm not a huge fan. Why? Just, it depends. It can be a bit gloopy, and I just don't like gloopy anything. Well, it can be, but if you froth it up or you heat it up and make it warm, it's okay. Eggnog. Well, you know, there's eggnog for dogs and cats, Jim. Why? <laughs> why? <laughs> just why is there? I'll answer? tell you I'm why. Sure. Sounds a little bit crazy, it does. But eggnog for dogs and cats, it's a fun yet healthy product from the Honest Kitchen. Oh, well, we like that. Yeah. Now, the let me tell you about this, this eggnog, yeah? One, I think, is a great gift to give someone it's very seasonal but it is actually very very healthy and uh, it's great for your pets and it's nutritional goat's milk jim oh. and what you do is you just add water to this dehydrated instant formula to create a nourishing servalone drink or you put over dry food for a delicious holiday treat if mm. you're doing dry food put some eggnog you on my snack you need to do wet food by the way everyone mm. it's put important you have wet food pour some eggnog on my snacks please i'm a dog now here's what's Im <laughs> important <laughs> about to n to learn about goat's milk ideally if you can get raw fermented goat's milk that's the way to go we have an issue here some kind of weird legality where we can't actually get it for our pets here Bit of a nightmare, but we can get the dehydrated. But ideally, if you can get raw goat's milk, that's the way to go. But anyway, goat's milk is very healthy. It has, um, their particular one supports gut health, has 5 billion, billion active probiotic cultures and digestive enzymes to promote general health and immune support for cats and dogs of all ages. It's human grade. I think that's important to know, human grade. And uh, you may not may already know this, but the Honest Kitchen, it meets rigorous safety standards to, to use the label human grade, ensuring the highest quality cat and dog treats as well. All natural, and it's a wholesome holiday treat. It's made from pasture-raised, free-ranging goats with no byproducts, no preservatives, no GMO ingredients, and it's made in the USA. Very good. It's very, it is, it's actually very, very good for the health. But why don't we amp it up a little bit further, yeah? How about pumpkin spice latte for your pets? Made from dehydrated goat's milk. That's oh right. Num, num, num. 
Yum. And that's got pumpkin in it, which is good for your pets, and some aromatic spices. And uh, same kind of thing. It's dehydrated. Add your water. Make sure it's not too hot before you give it to your pets. They can have it as a little holiday drink, or they can uh, put it on their food. And um, just follow the directions. And I thought that was a, a an, it's a nice, fun thing, but it's also a healthy thing. So I thought that was a, a great product that they came out with. They also have a golden milk one, Jim, with turmeric, mm. which I highly recommend. It's great for their health. Same kind of thing. I think it's goat's milk. Add your water to it, and the pets will really, really love it. Why don't you just put it all together for the dogs? Pumpkin, turmeric, Ooh, goat's milk. That would be disgusting. A dog would eat it. Well, yeah, they would. <laughs> and they would get both benefits. Y- yeah, but I w- mm, no. you might end up with a poopocalypse on your hands. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> here's a th- here's a question for you, Jim. Uh, Waiting. Did you just wipe your forehead on that microphone? Scratch my <laughs> eye. <laughs> here's a question for you, Jim. I wonder if you can answer it. Are table scraps influencing the l- evolution of Darwin's finches? <laughs> of whose finches? Darwin. Who feeds finches table scraps? Um, who doesn't these days? Who doesn't feed weird stuff like bread to ducks and whatever, yeah, which is uh, so horrible? I don't know. Uh, those are little birds. Giving them things that they're not supposed to eat probably isn't a great idea well, to me, you anyhow. So have you ha- ever thought about the impact it has on feeding birds? Basically, junk food, since it's not ancestral. It's not an ancestral diet, is it? You know, a bit of cheeseburger. Anyway, there's a study that um, out that um, may make you think again about what you feed birds and how it impacts biodiversity, Jim. Wow. And imagine, you know, you've... um, The Galapagos Islands, obviously, is is what we're talking about here. And I'll tell you why it's important in Darwin. If you don't know who Darwin is, we're going to cover a little bit of that later. But imagine you've just arrived on Santa Cruz Island in the Galapagos. And it's 104 degrees, which is 40 C, yeah? And the trip from the mainland was long, over 560 miles. And you could uh, you could use a cold drink and a good meal. And there are luckily restaurants abound in the urban center of Puerto Ayora, home to 12,000 residents, plus many of the over 200,000 tourists that visit the Galapagos every year. And you offer something greasy and delicious, and you're about to take a bite when a small, beady-eyed guest approaches you. It's a ground finch, and she wants your fries or your chips. And this is what this 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 study is. Um, it's an article um, by evolutionary ecologist Luis de Leon, and it's a study. Um, he's from the University of Massachusetts in Boston, Jim. Oh, the okay. study takes place in the Galapagos Islands. The Gla- Galapagos Islands have seen a massive rise in both tourists and residents since the 1960s. Yeah, around the world, many of the bird species have de- developed a palate for human food. And that's where the problem, you know. I think that's birds everywhere, though, isn't it? Well, yeah, but the, 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 why why this? But they have their bio, yeah. whatchamacallits, yeah. over there because it's the Galapagos yeah. uniqueness. It is, yes. And so around the world, many of the bird species have developed this palate for this human food. And, and Darwin's finch finchers have taken a liking to the scraps that the residents and tourists leave on their plates or what they actually feed to them. What's unique um, about Darwin's finishers, which is funny because my notes autocorrected to Darwin's finishers. So Darwin's finishers is now Darwin's finishers. Come on. Um, Is that they are still what they consider in the initial stages of the formation of the species. This was noted by the ecologist Luis. So it's a little bit different from other birds that love junk foods like ravens or little house sparrows. De, uh, De Leon no, uh, notes that some finch species can still interbreed and produce viable offspring. But he said, what maintains the separation between these species is their specialization on different food types. Mm. Take that away, and there may be serious evolutionary consequences. So they're studying it. Yeah, right. so that their food was very specialized, s- specifically what they ate that, you know, but if you take that away, well, it makes them different. If you take that away, mm, here we go. So he's studying the small, medium, and large ground finishers that eat soft, small, medium, and large hard seeds, respectively. 
uh, with beaks that are adapted to do the job. Given the role food has played in the formation the, of this species, he wanted to better understand how the increasing availability of human food might be affecting the processes. Mm. Yeah. Maybe like they don't have sharp beaks anymore. Well, he calls it seeds. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> Maybe their beaks are softening <laughs> up. <laughs> what? I don't know. I'm just guessing. I know. It's okay. You I'm love to guess, though, Jim. I'm not an ornithologist. We, s- we start. We start. We s- you didn't know I knew I did that. know that. I did know that because yeah. we talked about birds before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we start to watch a movie, yeah? Jim trying to guess what's happening in the movie in the first five minutes. So this is why, yeah. What? Anyway, he calls it cafeteria experiments. It's what he calls his research. And he and his research team prepare a selection of foods in egg carton trays that included natural seed types, along with the option of rice, potato chips, biscuits, or for our audience, the U.S. audience, cookies. <laughs> yeah. Now, these trays were left out in various sites, some sites where there's very little human influence, and they were located seven miles away and others in rather urbanized areas of Puerto Ayora. Uh, Finches at the site where there was less human influence completely ignored the food trays. Yet the Puerta Ayora finches consumed human f- food trays in uh, 100% of the time, and it was the same foods 100% of the time. Scraps. De Leon says, no, it wasn't scraps because he did the... Seeds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, De Leon, uh, he says, if the boundary between finches species is no longer maintained by the food they eat, it's possible that ground finches could collapse back into one species instead of being diverse. Yeah. Now, this is interesting. So, uh, so evolutionary ecologist J. Albert, I don't know how to pronounce it. You, you, why, you, we. Yui, 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 Albert, Yui, Yui, Yui. If anyone knows how to pronounce U Y, <laughs> let me know on the postcard. Uh, so he's <laughs> so J Albert Yui <laughs> at the University of Miami studies how biological diversity is generated and maintained, and this is his explanation of how this might happen. Right now, you're looking at blank TV. That's, that was just hilarious, Jim. I'm sorry. I, f- I feel you know. I feel like today. I feel like oh look, there's a squirrel. This is what I feel like today. And you are definitely acting that way as well. What's wrong with us? I don't know. <laughs> I'm looking at how old that TV is <laughs> and why we even. It's have actually it. not old. It's a year old. It's old. It's a year old. It's old tech. And and he gave me that. It doesn't matter. It's a year old. Yeah, I remember him buying it a year ago. No, he bought an old TV a year ago. No, he didn't. He's a very early adopter. He likes all the new stuff. Anyway, so let's get back because we're all over the place right now. We are all over the place right now. Um, so, Jay Albert, we at the University of Miami, studies how bio- biological diversity is generated and maintained, and this is how he explains it might happen. Right now, he says, the finchers choose not to interbreed and instead typically choose mates that look like them. For example, large birds with large beaks choose others of the same. However, he explains, if the finchers are all eating the same junk food, then the evolutionary pressure to maintain their physical differences, like their size and shape of their beaks, is relaxed. So they all start looking more like each other. Then they start interbreeding and the species boundaries are lost. This is very interesting. Darwin's finches have a, a, an incredible history serving as a textbook example of how natural selection operates in the world, therefore creating new specie- species. The interference of humans makes this rather troubling. This could cause the collapse of the unique species that you find there, and with a few decades, within this few decades, it's all changing. It's kind of sad, really. Now, De, De, Le- De Leon hopes um, bringing to the light the human impact on species by a change in their diet. He says, when we think about preserving biodiversity, we think about protecting species like mountain gorillas or jaguars. But what we show with this research is that we also need to look at protecting the processes, 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 that lead to the formation of the species that make up that diversity. Now, the Galapagos, uh, Galapagos Islands is a volcanic... Uh, ooh, um, Archipelago. Archipelago. Oh, archipelago. That sounds like a singing term, Jim. Archipel- Chain of islands. Oh, archipelago. Oh, really? In the mm. Pacific Ocean. Yeah. That's what that means. Yeah, yeah. It's a volcanic archipelago. 
correct? Like Hawaiian Islands. Oh, okay. Archipelago. It, it's it's considered one of the world's foremost destinations for wildlife u- viewing, which we've known that for a long time. Um, it's a prov- province of, let's do a little test, a little quiz. Micronesia. Ecuador. <laughs> it lies about 1,000 kilometers off its coast. Its isolated terrain shelters a diversity of plant and animal species, many found nowhere else. Now, Charles Darwin insisted in 1835 and his observation of Galapagos species later inspired his theory of evolution. Not evolution, depending on how you pronounce it. Darwinism is a theory of biological evolution developed by the English naturalist Charles Darwin. That was um, 1809 to 1882 and others, stating that all species of organisms arise and develop through the natural selection of small inherited variations that increase the individual's ability to compete, survive, and reproduce. And that's that. So, if you go to the Galapagos Islands, throw the food away that you don't eat, and certainly don't feed the animals, because you will impact, and we will lose some of those very unique species. Do the Galapagonians have good uh, trash removal systems and recycling and things with lids, you know, like we have in our national parks? Mm, I don't know. You know, to keep the uh, wildlife from They're going to have to do something, but you've also got to stop the people from doing it as well, Jim. You really have to. That's the challenge. That's the challenge, is the people. Very interesting. They need to try and stop that from happening. Because you will lose those unique species only found there. Because they'll all start looking the same and mating with the same. Mm -hmm. There you go. There's my... Like people. (laughs) No. Mm. I'm just saying random things right now. <laughs> so that's the Darwin's finishers, or as my autocorrect made it, doorways finishers. Oh gosh, autocorrect! I do have some good autocorrect. I must admit. Remember that ta- uh, time I told you, Steve Lee? This is when we could use our phones in our car. And I was actually in traffic, just stood still, and Steve texted me, said, uh, "What are you doing right now?" And I texted back, "I'm sat in my car." And he wrote back, I think that's cruel. And uh, when I look back at the text, it said, I'm sat in my cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had some good autocorrects. That's, that's one of my favorite ones. Um, let's go on to, because it is winter, and it's, I mean, it is cold for us here. What's the temperature? It was uh, about 40 this morning for me. Uh, we know that's not cold compared to other places in the country and the and the world. But for us, it's cold. But if you're in a place where there's a heck of a lot of snow and people are using, what do they call it, antifreeze, they're using defrosting stuff, liquids, what do they call that? Salt. Salt. Oh, my gosh. It's terrible on your pet's feet. It's really terrible. So I'm going to do a real number on your pet's paws. Because there are so many contamination, t- some contaminants. What am I saying? Contaminants. Contaminants on the yeah. ground. So you've got your antifreeze, your salt, and you know that you used to try and melt. Cinder ash. Yeah, there's so many awful things. And um, antifreeze. It can cause yeah, it can cause chemical burns, and oh, it's just awful. So what can you do, especially if your dog doesn't like wearing boots? Because I mean, of course, that is. That seems like the most practical thing, but a lot of them won't wear them. They just won't wear them. So what are you going to do? Well, I would suggest you either purchase or you can make some paw wax or paw balm, as they call it. Uh, You can make it at your home very inexpensively. I'm going to tell you how to do that. There are commercial products available uh, similar to... um (laughs) So funny. going on i wrote my show i swear these autocorrects it says <laughs> there are commercial products available similar to apple wax no idea what that is or poor bum <laughs> this, oh i know what it was i know what it was i didn't write this bit i just did a talk to text so he thought poor, poor bum was poor bum mm. <laughs> oh my god but if you do read the ingredient labels typically there will be some unnecessary c- unnecessary chemicals in them that you just don't need because of course they've got to keep some kind of a shelf life they also have to be able to make make them stable in warmer temperatures 
So you may find that there are some ingredients in them that are just not good for your pets. And this is why um, I've made my own in the past. Thankfully, you don't have to use it very often anyway. But um, making your own, you always know exactly what you're putting in them. You can make a small batch, make it fresh, and or make it just when you need it, put it in the fridge. And paw wax, it, uh, at this time of year, makes great gifts. You, know, you can get cute tins, put little paw print stickers on them, and, and throw them in a little bag, and you've got a, a lovely gift for an animal lover at this time of year. To now, go along with their notebooks. To go along with your, yeah, with your sound notebooks. <laughs> and well, this is what you're going to do. This is how you make it at home. And um, you don't use a lot of ingredients. Use a double boiler. Now, a double boiler, you can buy a double boiler, or you can just use... A, a, a saucepan and a bowl and in between them is your water and you're going to heat up your water and you can also use something like a wooden chopstick you're going to stir it all around because you can toss that out at the end but here are your ingredients three ounces of beeswax three tablespoons of coconut oil three tablespoons of avocado oil and three tablespoons of calendula and i'm going to tell you what all of these will do for your pet beeswax protects the paw the coconut is an antibacterial, antifungal, and, and, and the calendula heals the skin, and avocado oil has mega healing properties. So every single one of those things is going to do something good for your pet's paws. Once it's all melted, um, you can then decanter it into whatever containers you want. Um, if you have a dog, though, here's a tip with large paws, yeah, and you don't want to be you know, getting that on your fingers and trying to rub it in, Use I suggest using a very shallow round tin, yeah. And then right. what you would do, or a square tin, and you actually will swipe your pet's paw across the top of it, uh, top top of the wax, and they'll be coated. And uh, I probably should do a tutorial on this because I say it's easy, it's inexpensive, it's effective, but it really will help during winter. Now, when you do walk in winter, even if you are using the paw wax as well. You do need to clean your pet's pet's paws when they come in from, you know, anything that they could have got on their paws. And I'll, uh, yeah, I think I'll probably do a tutorial on this. I'll, I'll, I'll put the recipe, though, in the show notes so that you can, uh, you know, grab that. And then, yeah, if I do a tutorial, then I can just do a link to all the, all the uh, supplies that you will need on Amazon. Make it an entire list. Make it easy for you. But it is something to consider. And um, another thing you do need to be careful of at this time of year is... Uh, antifreeze because it uh, tastes sweet. Yeah, a lot of and birds, dogs, they cats will die, and it happened to Terrible. my sister's cat. And, you know, so when they'd used antifreeze, it dripped. She li- she licked it, and she passed away very quickly. And um, I know there's there's a group that's trying to get it relabeled, and also something added into it that is very um, repugnant to your pet, so they'll not even attempt to go near it. But it's terrible. It's such a needless way for any pet to lose its life. And, um, you know, so do be very, very aware of that. If you've got that in your garage or you feel like it may have dripped. And while we're on the topic of winter and pets and cats, cats like to find somewhere warm. Often they will sleep on the top of a tire in the well, the wheel well. Um, What you want to do is maybe um, clap your hands, beep your horn before you drive off anywhere if there's a cat hanging around on your vehicle at any point. So think about that. Since we are talking about little cats, let's talk about Kitten Lady because this is how I think we're going to close our show out. Kitten Lady, Hannah Shaw, we've had her on the show. She's the Kitten Lady. We love the work that she does. She looks after neonatal kittens and she teaches you how to look after neonatal kittens. If she has one of her free workshops in your city, go. You will learn so much about kittens and how to care for them. And, and she always says the goal is to say goodbye, is to get them adopted so you can help another little kitten. And these are cats that don't have mummies and they need your help. And she tells you from what I call soup to nuts exactly the steps you are going to take and how long it takes and she's such an amazing resource. She has this website that if in the middle of the night you've got something going on with your little kitten that you're looking after, go on the website. You'll find the answers on that website. It's a She's just a brilliant resource. She's this cool, almost like rock, rockabilly, tattered up, fabulous, fabulous person, really making an impact in the world of neonatal kittens. Anyway, she wrote this the other day. 
And I thought this really summed up what she does and what other people do who foster. And I thought it was, it'd be a great way to just close out the show. This is what she wrote. How do you say goodbye without crying? The answer is that sometimes I don't, and that's okay. It is normal and healthy to be emotional when saying goodbye to an animal you've raised, especially one as special as Jumbo. I try to approach myself with gentle kindness and acceptance in these moments, and I and f- and to feel really proud of myself for being strong enough to save little lives. The truth is that he literally would not have survived without foster care, and I wouldn't have been able to foster him without saying goodbye to so many kittens before him. Goodbye is a gift. Saying goodbye to him is a promise to future babies like him. It's a small sacrifice of emotional vulnerability in exchange for the gift of their very life, and it is worth every tear. That's perfectly put, isn't it, Jim? It's well done. It's it's well done. And on that note, we're dedicating the show to my friend's dog, Misty, who passed away very recently. And it made us incredibly sad. Gorgeous, gorgeous girl. A gorgeous girl. I know that um, she's going to be missed dreadfully. And um, there's a hard road ahead when you lose a pet. But this is for Misty, this show. She was a gorgeous girl and uh, impacted a lot of people. Well, if you've liked today's show and you're listening on your smartphone, and in, there's always that option. You can share the show um, on social media. Tell your friends all about the show. And remember, you can always help an animal in need. Either rescue, adopt, donate, volunteer, or share their information. Rescue your next family member. Replace the word shop with adopt. And be kind to all animals. Thank you, Jim. You made me laugh today. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> That's great. (laughs) And thank you, the listeners. Of course, without you, this would be quite ridiculous without listeners. (laughs) And you've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio, where it's all about pets, people, and pop culture. I'm your host, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs, and always kiss your pets good morning and good night. And I'll see you next time. You've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. You've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. Visit Vegas Rock Dog Radio for more information. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe on iTunes and iHeartRadio. And remember, give your fur babies a big kiss from me, Sam, the Queen of rock and roll dogs. You must not rely on the information in this broadcast from our host as an alternative to medical advice from your veterinarian. If you have any specific questions about a medical matter regarding your pets, you should consult your veterinarian or specialist. Yeah.